Um, all right, let's see here. Please Dreaming work Facebook, Facebook Live. It says it's live. I want to make sure that I see it, though. All right. We should be live in ChatCon. I'm going to have to go in and click in. So, welcome, folks. Let's start with an introduction. Peter, can you please tell us what you do? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, do, I do a number of things. Um, uh, basically, the theme of, I try to make the theme of my life is only do cool stuff. Um, <laughs> so, uh, which I have found to be pretty effective, um, which is great. Um, so I actually kind of have two professions. Um, one of them is that, well, yeah. One of them is that I am a contortion and trapeze coach. So I teach people how to do circus. Um, and then I also perform um, more of a freelance unless I get like an ongoing contract. Um, and then my other job is that I am um, specifically an exotic animal trainer. Um, my most of my experience comes from birds um and uh i could talk about birds all day um <laughs> i started training when i was about 11 um and i'm 25 now um i got my first bird when i was eight but yeah so then ele about 11 um i got my macaw that i actually still have today her name is azaria she just turned 25 so we're actually the same age nice. um, <laughs> We're growing up together. She's the best. Yeah. I mean, she doesn't really like very many other people, but who cares? I'm the most important one, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, which we've worked on, and she's a lot better. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'm really into, like, positive reinforcement, um, and we'll, yeah, and, like, kind of going the force-free route, um, and a lot of the training I've done um, really uh, necessitates that. Um, so... Um, not only do I train birds, I also train my other, my slightly newer specialty is actually reptiles. Um, specifically snakes are kind of my, my home area. Um, and it is so much fun. It's a very drastically different, hold on, I'm just muting my phone so that, um, people don't shut up. Um, <laughs> it's a very different kind of training situation. Um, hey, Emily. <laughs> hey okay emily is like my bestie so that's great um so uh so snakes are i'm training snakes a lot um and a lot of people come to me with like the, well i didn't even realize you could train a snake um and my response is like well why couldn't you right um some people think about that with birds too a little less so because i think like there's like been a lot of like social media um around like crows being really intelligent and recognizing faces or like the new Caledonian crow research where they build their own tools and all that kind of thing, um, which is great. Um, but with, with snakes, for not only is there a, a huge, um, like cultural fog around people hating them yeah. um, and viewing them as dangerous and, and stuff. Um, I know that in fact, actually you, <laughs> I remember sending you a snake thing and you're like, I mean, that's cool, but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah just, they uh it's 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 a lack of practice i think it's not like a it's not some sort of visceral thing it's just a lack of being around and experience um usually yeah. like the other day um it's that time of year where i'm running a little bit more and i'm outdoors and mm -hmm. so you, i usually end up almost running on top of like a bull snake or something when i'm going running on the trails so yesterday or no last week i, I almost ran on a cross two and so it's usually one of those things where it's just like some unfortunate uh uh interactions are also like just kind of get me like, whoo. <laughs> well, I think like, it's kind of how I feel about spiders too. And that like, I think people are less afraid, maybe not always, but I think sometimes people are less afraid of the spider themselves rather than just the fact that all of a sudden there's a spider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Mean, I'm afraid of a dog that I didn't know was there, right? Like, <laughs> I'm afraid of people I didn't know was there, right? It's just yeah, about yeah. the shock value, right? Yeah. Um, so, I, so I think that's a part of it as well. Um, but also I think, you know, we've had this like perpetuation of like snakes are venomous, snakes are dangerous and all that kind of thing. Um, when, uh, and there are venomous snakes and stuff, I personally do not work with any of them. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I think they're really cool. Oh, just started working with dragons, cool. I'm assuming bearded dragons? I have one. Hopefully real dragons. <laughs> real dragon, um, totally. <laughs> yeah, um, I have a bearded dragon, actually, he's right over there. His name is Credence, um, and I got him, like, 
Craigslist is just not a good place for me to be. I just <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> like, but I want it. So I went out and got him and it was just good. He's doing a lot better. He was not in the most ideal situation. But uh, yeah, um, I guess that's kind of, oh, it's worth mentioning that I use they, them pronouns. Um, just in case that's a thing. Appreciate you. Um, yeah, I think that. that's kind of my my background a little bit. Cool. Uh, we had a confirmation from Jacqueline. Yes, Bearded Dragons. Awesome. Uh, a hello to Credence and uh, Emily shared. She's been a huge help overcoming the fear of spiders. <laughs> she, uh, she sends me pictures of spiders she finds in her house all the time. And I'm always <laughs> like, great job. And, and uh, yeah, it's awesome. Spiders are the best. <laughs> so, I have a couple of those too. So thanks for sharing. When we first met, um, it was at ChatCon Seattle 2018, talked to Vid at the bar. And it was one of those things where very quickly I was uh, – finding myself in a conversation deep in the difference between, or I guess deep in like the importance of positive reinforcement procedures and not using aversive control procedures when working with really any organism. Um, and that's, that's an area that, I don't know, I feel like I don't even have enough training in still. So I don't know where to start with this, but I'm really excited to see um, maybe today we can set the course for people. We at least have some videos that you have to share. Um, mm -hmm. but is there a topic you want to start on within that? Um, and this is well, like, I, you could I, soapbox I, rant from one to one to another. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, you're not the first person who has said that like they met me and all of a sudden they were really deep in a conversation. And, and that's, I, I love that though. Like it did is, not take this me is long a very to go, important like, one. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, on the point of you saying like, you don't have a whole bunch of experience in terms of training animals. Like I also think it's totally like, I am not a BCBA. Like I did not go to school professional or not, you know, I not go to school for this. Um, yeah. I've, been doing it for a while um 20 years but, right <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but um but at the same time like I just want to make clear that I'm I'm not a I don't train people um, yeah that, you know, I do teach people all the time and, and that I, was the I guess the exciting awesome. if anyone's uh not heard a check on that was the exciting kind of meshing of the two worlds there was that you'd have people that primarily worked with one species over another different settings coming together and kind of sharing so um yeah we've got the really caveat excited. out there now what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, so just like that out there, I'm not a professor or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing is too, is I'm always like super down to be challenged with any of my ideas. Um, I prefer constructively, but you know, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we all do. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so well, let's talk. I know they're in the little picture we were talking about. They have we had a picture of my boys up there, um, my macaws. So um, yeah, so both of those birds that were on the picture are mm -hmm. Milo and Rakan, um, and I hand raised both of them from about fifty five days old. Um, and so, I mean, I was there. Like, I literally did not spend twenty four hours away from them for the first eight months. Really? Um, and, uh, and even like that first 24 hours, like I like just wanted to go back home to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, I've never been a parent of a human child, but I feel like I felt something similar at least. Yeah. Um, and so basically from the time that they were flapping, um, we started working on training, um, and my goal for getting, so, so technically Rakan is my, my, one of my roommate's birds, but I raised him and I do most of the training. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, so my, Rakan's on the bottom and Milo's on the top. Um, yeah, it is my boys. Um, <laughs> so as you can see, they are outside. Um, so this is not something I recommend most people do with their birds, um, quite frankly, <laughs> um, especially, um, without a lot of know-how um, and training and a lot of people to support them. So for instance, um, I actually don't um, consult people to free fly their birds. 
<laughs> um, I really like, I really don't like the whole do as I say, not as I do, but I think like there is a lot that needs to go into the understanding of how to safely fly a bird. Yeah. Um, and the reality too, is that it's never going to be 100% safe. Um, even you can mitigate as much as you want. Um, but there is still going to be a car. There's still going to be a strong wind and you never know what's kind of going on with them. Right. Um, so, uh, traditionally in the bird training world, and we're talking thousands of years for basically when falconry started, um, which is the act of having a bird, um, and hunting with that bird, um, which is a really cool process. Um, it's really quite amazing to watch. Um, I've been on, um, hunting flights with, uh, raptors before. It's really amazing. I mean, few things compared to watching a peregrine falcon stoop and, you know, go up and then drop at 180 million, uh, 180 <laughs> Miles per hour, 180 yeah. million miles is a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it's just, it's a really beautiful thing. Um, now, traditionally in falconry, um, which seeped its way into training non-raptor birds, so parrots, um, crows, uh, vultures, which in my opinion are not birds of prey, birds of prey, but let's not even go there. Um, I have emotions, you guys, about things. <laughs> I have feelings. Um, so uh, that was a, basically one of the things they did was they weight managed, right? So the way weight managing worked was um, the concept was, okay, I've got this bird and um, if it's not, and this is a really like rudimentary explanation of it, um, if the bird does not come when I call it or come fast enough, um, it's clearly eaten too much and I will feed it less today so that its weight drops and it will be more hungry the next day. Mm -hmm. um so one term that is often used for this is weight management um i do believe a more accurate term for it is food deprivation yeah. um now uh you are managing their weights um but i think there's like an element of like if if i'm overweight i'm going to manage my weight right yeah. not necessarily by a food deprivation right so I you know there is do you want to finish up no go ahead I, there is uh a lot of pigeon research done in behavior analysis. Um, I don't know, probably the first 30, 40 decades, or 30, I almost said 30 or 40 decades there, <laughs> 30 or four, uh, 40 no, years. We're doing great with the <laughs> numbers. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I know there was uh, some, some controversy, right, around like the, the weight management that was going on there, because typically it was 80% of their free feeding weight. Mm -hmm. um, and the research study was looking at sampling uh, pigeons out in the natural environment and found that there was really no significant difference between the weight that they were out in the, out in the wild. They were roughly around that 80% of free feeding weight that mm -hmm. they typically were out in the lab. So um, I remember reading that and feeling like a little bit of a sense of relief. I don't know if that's where you were heading with this, but it's one of those things where it's like, I, I, it matched up to reality a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's, I think the thing about that, though, is that when you're looking at, and I haven't read that paper, I'd love to, you should totally send it. I'll find it. Um, uh, is that when you're looking at, at least in the case of pigeons, so I've raised pigeons, I have six, actually. Um, <laughs> at some point, I should go through the list of how many animals I have. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll do that. <laughs> it's insane. Uh, <laughs> um, is that, you know, birds who are flying outside living a wildlife, um, especially when it comes to feral pigeons, they tend to be a little bit smaller in general, but they're also packed with muscle. Um, they're flying all the time. Um, and so I think on some level, if we're looking at directly the same weights, um, it's not a super great way to compare it just because we're looking at the muscle buildup of a bird who's flying every single day to get food, to, to um, move with the rest of the flock to escape mm -hmm. predators versus a bird who's living in like a small enclosure that gets, you know. So I think there's, I think there's something to that, but again, I need to um, read the thing. Um, my thing with weight, weight, um, weight management or food deprivation is I find it really unethical. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, um, it, the other thing is it's also not necessary. Um, I, also I have not trained um, raptors extensively. I've worked with some of them. Um, not under a, a weight management situation or a food deprivation situation. Um, but my birds go, I very rarely ever take them outside if they haven't had a full breakfast yet. 
Um, and so, and that's for like a lot of reasons. Um, the other thing is, is when I have an animal who's too hungry, they're not paying attention to the training. They're just throwing anything they possibly can at you to get food. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously you can get to a certain point where they, they do focus a little bit more on the training. Um, but I think in general, like if I've got a parrot in front of me and all they're doing is staring at my treat bag, they're not looking at my cues. Um, they're not necessarily paying attention to the behavior that they're using or doing. Yeah. Um, and that's not what I want. Um, I want them to know how they're getting to where they are in order to learn from it. Cool. So... I'm convinced. What are these? Uh, what are these additional? Or you said it's it's not necessary. Yeah, that's what I loved. So yeah. So how do you get around that? So if you were to train a whale, mm -hmm. would you put it on a scale every single day to measure how much it weighed? <laughs> um, not. Probably not. Right. We also um, don't do this in the traditional ABA early intervention work and such either. Right. at all totally. in fact that would be flagged as a, a very big question mark and ethical issue right yeah. so um yeah so people don't weigh their dogs to train them um you know all that kind of thing so for me i kind of get to the point where i'm like well why are birds so different all of a sudden um and i run a um i co-ran a little company um called reptelligence with my friend carrie kish um, and one thing that we say, um, it's all about reptile training and welfare and enrichment and all that kind of thing. Um, and one thing that we say is like, blank is not other, right? Snakes are not other, um, mm -hmm. turtles are not other, birds are not other. They're not, they're different, but they're not different, right? Like you don't have to, every time you go from one species, you don't have to change your entire concept of principles in order to mm -hmm. work with them. Um, so I think that's one of the things. And the other thing is, is like, my boys are at least and if looking at parrots, my boys are proof that you don't need to use weight management. Um, and and yeah, and there's just a really long history of training and building that relationship. Huge up. learning history, like of positive reinforcement for the trainer. Yeah, right. Like it works. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> it's also not necessary, and there's fallouts to it. Um, so. Uh, you know, and we're not working with, it's not traditionally in like, uh, like a clinical lab setting, um, ad lib weight. So sometimes with, sometimes with, um, birds, you'll talk about like training birds, you'll talk about an ab, uh, ad lib weight, but that's not the same as the ad lib weight that someone would use in a lab setting with a pigeon. Right. Okay. Um, so that's one thing to consider too, in terms of like the difference between them. Um, and I don't like, I don't mean to like sit on this one for a while, but it's just one thing I want to make clear is that I do not do that with my birds. Um, and um, I have found it not necessary. Um, I would say that my birds recalls have very low latency. Um, I've been success successfully flying them for a while. Um, there are only two, so I can't say I've been flying them for 30 years and never had it, right? So I want to be yeah, yeah. that, but at the same time, I mean, I mean Milo's recall is really solid. Um, and of course, you know, not just keeping him full is not my goal, right? Like I still need the reinforcers to be reinforcers. Um, but basically the only times he really gets nuts is that if we're training, right? So he knows that when we train, we get pecans and almonds and walnuts and, and pine nuts and which, let me tell you, pine nuts are very expensive. So, <laughs> yeah, but they work really well. So I'll drop the money. So, um, you know what I mean? So that we definitely have to create motivation, but there's ways of doing that without not uh, feeling them as much. Is it, are any of these in the videos that you shared? Cause I know like there's a uh, Milo video. Yes, there's a couple. Let me see. I know I've got your, I've got it up. So and regarding pine nuts, uh, I grew up in an area where we used to snag them every once in a while. A tree only produces them every seven years. So they're very, uh, very hard to get. Yeah. Because yeah. of that. So the, um, the last video I sent you, just before you said, okay, sweet, thank you. Cool. There's a few in there, but... The first one is really cool. I actually, <laughs> this is my first day back from a consult. Cool. In Colorado. Share computer sound. Advanced portion of the screen. 
See if I can get it more or less full screen for folks too. Can you see that all right, Peter? Yeah, I can see it fine. Cool. I pause. That's Rakan coming in. <laughs> but Milo's looping behind the tree. And I got really excited. And so I started bouncing and I started him. <laughs> I was like, So that's my Milo man. Well, can you describe what's going on here real quick for us maybe? Yeah, absolutely. So this is his looping behavior, which I worked on for a really long time. Um, and I wish I could say, here's ABC, how it happened. And then, but really kind of one day he started doing it and I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it was almost a little bit more of a capture. I mean, yeah, you can tell how excited I am right there, right? Yeah. Um, so, it's kind of funny. People will be like, aren't you afraid they're going to fly away? And I'm like, dude, my biggest problem is getting them off of me. Yeah. Like, like sometimes I just want to do shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> my hair and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, so I've actually am working with them on training them to fly further and further away from me. Um, okay. And that's because, one, I want them in the air m more. I want them getting more exercise. B, it's really cool. <laughs> um at the end of the day um and i've got a lot of um you can probably hear all the birds too i apologize yeah, for that. a little bit um, it's not bad <laughs> it's part of the game yeah 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 you Comes know the territory good. yeah exactly um my native habitat um yeah so that's what i've been working i also have a lot of goals for him um in terms of i want him to uh, he'll sometimes like barrel roll um, or do behaviors that would be used um, for <laughs> um, for um, basically predator evasive movements. Okay. Um, so they'll do this thing. Sometimes we call it jinking, where they're flying and then they just twist like that. I've actually seen that uh, on my run a couple of times. I've watched some birds that were two different species going after each other, and the one will barrel roll over. Totally. Yeah, it's yeah. super cool. Um, and raptors, a lot of raptors, um, falcons for sure, what they'll do is they'll, um, when they're courting, they'll have one um, with a piece of, I always forget if it's the top one or the bottom one, but basically they have a piece of food and they toss it to the other one and the other one flips up and grabs it. Mm -hmm. um, it's really cool. Um, so my goal is actually to get that stuff on cue. Okay. Um, which I think would just be like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> yeah, um, no, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. Um, but, but he and I can do it. We're a good team. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Is there any other videos in this one that you wanted me to share with people? Yeah. Um, let's see. In the same post. Yeah. The second post? one is them. Um, well, this might not, oh, this one's where he lands on the aviary, but it's still cool. You get to see him flying. Cool. Let's see here. Ready, set. That was, our, sorry, buddy. <laughs> that was our first one, my bad. No worries. I can watch it all day, so. <laughs> okay, so he's coming right out of that tree. So I am cueing him. This is one time where he decides that, um, so what I think he was doing was he was trying to get to me, but just wasn't low enough, so he turned um, and went to the aviary. Um, and, uh, yeah, but he does that pretty frequently. Um, this is his uh, first year flying, so this year he's gotten really good um, and just built a lot of muscle and learning. <laughs> How to handle stuff um so i mean that's a high tree that he's dropping out of um oh it definitely looks like it yeah um let's see yeah my man um let's see if i've got another one for you um the other thing is i tend to not use bridges that much um 
or what I call intentional bridges, because I think on some level, unless we're maybe, there's my boy. Okay, sorry. I just, <laughs> um, uh, I'm open to my relationship with him being unhealthy in terms of how much I love him. That's <laughs> totally possible. Um, thing was, I wanted a military macaw since I was like eight. So yeah. Um, so that picture was him of him was actually uh, right after he had taken a bath up in the rain. Nice. Um, so he will, when it's been raining or whatever, he will climb onto tree or fly into trees and stuff, and he'll literally roll down them. Um, it's adorable. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he gets super wet. And what's really cool is that, like, you know, that's a really high value reinforcer when he wants to take a bath. Um, and it's the kind of thing where when he's taking a bath, I don't call him. Yeah. To kind of do it till he's done. Um, which is fine. I don't really mind that. Um, and it's one of the reasons I don't fly if I have 15 minutes, right? Like <laughs> if all of a sudden he finds a pine cone that is the perfect pine cone and he wants to sit there and chew it for five minutes, I can't really, uh, yeah, I can't really, I, it would be a, unfair and unfair of me to ask him to like stop doing that because he's having a good time, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, do you see this question we have in here? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, do you think, uh, large birds form the same attachment relations as the humans that birds and cats recently and cats have been found to let secure, insecure, etc. What, uh, does that look like behaviorally in birds? Um, absolutely. Um, they do. Um, I would love to have more, um, research on this. Um, but, uh, one of the things that actually as a consultant for behavior, I end up running into, um, it is, the extreme version of that <laughs> um and the birds start performing um copulatory and mating behaviors with their humans mm -hmm. um which is not an easy thing to deal with necessarily um so basically um i mean i've seen birds try and like i've had birds try and coax me into like a, a, a cabinet that they found that they want me to come into with them so that we can make a nest and stuff like that um, I've had birds try to feed me, um, I've been humped a bajillion times, like, they totally, you know, they totally do that kind of thing, they definitely, yeah. um, do form bonds, um, there is an imprinting that goes on, um, it's a little less, um, to my knowledge, it's a little less intense in altricial birds, um, so there's precocial and altricial, um, altricial is, like, a crow or a parrot where they hatch and they're not able to walk. They have to grow all their feathers. They have to, you know, mom and dad have to take care of them. Precocial is like a chicken or a quail or a pheasant um, or a duck, um, right? They can walk really quickly right after um, hatching and then they can follow their mom within the first day of life. So that would be precocial. The others would be altricial. Um, so precocial, um, birds have a really strong imprinting process um, where they really latch on to the first thing, not the first thing they see, but they have an interaction with and they really latch on to that. Um, and altricials do to a degree as well. Um, and which is why some people really suggest um, flying or like raising a baby bird in order to fly it. Um, I don't think it's necessary, necessarily. Um, I did it um, and it certainly makes things a little easier in some yeah. terms um but sometimes what's happened i've seen in the free flight parrot community is people kind of rely on that a little bit too much and don't really back it up with the training mm -hmm. um yeah but no they definitely bond to people for sure um what are what are some of the things that kind of that you see out there that crawl make your skin crawl is there is there training techniques out there that maybe we could <laughs> that we could maybe? Ask this. Um, <laughs> I actually told my friend I was like Ryan's gonna ask me like <laughs> <"This is> insane. <laughs> well, um, well, and and it's fine. Yeah, it's I, don't, fine. I don't want you, I just I don't want you to live that, but I, I think it's one of those things where if we can maybe paint a quick picture and say here's your alternative that might be useful. Right. Um. Oh shit. Hold on one second. Um. Weight management, food deprivation, that's okay. a big one. Um, there has been some really, at least in the bird community, um, there's been some really horrible things that I don't see as often anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but Susan Friedman has this video 
uh, that was made like ages ago of where I think it was her and Steve and they were Steve Martin and they were putting, they put this together, this video of like trainers suggestions of how to handle your bird. Right. Yeah. Um, and it was like, put your bird in a paper bag and shake it. Um, uh, dunk them in water, hold them by yeah. their feet, bring them around. Um, like there's just like a lot of barbaric things yeah. um, that have been involved. Um, and, and just, yeah. And I don't, and the hard part is when we're looking at, um, or at least when I'm looking at a lot of things that people do that I would consider either unethical or completely unnecessary, mm -hmm. um, is that I don't think it always comes from like a, a point, a point of maliciousness. Yeah. Like a mount, mount 10 or something, but just mount, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it comes from this point of here are my preconceived no conceived notions and my learning history and that just like goes into it right so yeah. when wherever we're talking about with weight management and falconry um we're having i mean coming up to someone and say hey here this thing that you've been doing for thousands of years in your basic well, basically culture of yeah. training um is is not ideal can we do yeah. something else that's an intense thing. Um, yeah. And obviously there's been all sorts of things like that um, in human culture in general um, yeah. of being like, hey, you've been doing this for a while. Doesn't make it okay. <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, so learning history has a lot to do with all these kind of things. And so um, I try to, especially when I'm like interacting in those situations, first off, um, I actually, for myself, I, I like get a kind of emotional about some of this stuff and I have to like really take a step back and like check with myself like am, am I actually able to have this conversation with someone right now without kind of losing it um and you know there and the other thing is like for instance when people get really mad about stuff and then they start like calling people names I'm like okay is your goal to complain and yeah. be mad is your goal to change their behavior because yeah. I don't think that's going to be super successful kind of thing right <laughs> yeah um you know, but at the same time, when I see someone slack um, a, a leash on a dog with a prong collar and then pull it back, mm -hmm. um, there is not a whole lot that can hold me back with that. I I can't very yeah, yeah. well walk up and be like, hey, so maybe there's another way of doing that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? That's really, that's really hard. Yeah. Um, let's see, some other stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff that seems kind of benign. Um, and you know that are not putting your bird in a paper bag and shaking it that are not um you know holding it in a towel until it and soothing them till it relax right yeah. um but there's certain stuff like one one standard um to that's taught um is pressing into a bird's belly to get them to step up um so Basically, what that is is it functions as like a negative reinforcement contingency. Okay. Uh, I'm going to press into your belly. You're going to be pushed off balance. So in order to not fall, you're going to step up onto me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then what happens is they start to anticipate it, right? They're like, "Oh, the hand's coming toward me here. Let me step up." Yeah, yeah. Kind of um, and that's just really common. Um, and that's how people are taught to do stuff, right? And that was uh, similar to when we first talked about this in, uh, at that event, Megan Miller was having similar conversations about the negative reinforcement contingencies are kind of built into the, the human training aspects and mm -hmm. questioning those, right? And it's like, right. hey, we're kind of in this reinforcement loop and it may be working, but does it need to work this way? And what are the side effects of it working this way, right? Totally. We need to be open to the fact that there can be fallout. Yeah. Um, and that that fallout may not be immediately um, visible. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's not what caused it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see things happen down the road that I think could very well happen because of this thing that you've been doing from over here. Yeah. But you've been doing so long, so why would it change? Right. I think that that can come later. Um, I mean, when you're looking at like flooding and stuff like that, you have to. Mm -hmm. Like generalized fear and little Albert kind of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, well, one other thing that I've seen um, that does make me a little uncomfortable is um, 
the the tactile prompting. Okay. Uh, Can you great. describe an uh, example? Um, so uh, I typically use it use see it used with humans, um, mm -hmm. where it's like pick up this toy, and so they hold the hand. Yeah. Totally pick it up. Just it. yeah. So yeah. Anytime when you're just kind of like a uh, yeah, the tactile, full physical sort of hand over hand prompting, right? Yeah, I think yeah. it. It was interesting when, for instance, when we were at chat and there was a video of that. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of taken aback only because I'm like, because I'm like, I, I couldn't do that with a bird. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then I was thinking, and, and as I was watching it, I was like, okay, what are some other ways that we could do that without doing that? And like yeah. I said, I've never worked with um, people on the, or, you know, people on the spectrum or nonverbal people. And all that but I also thing. know you're probably not doing this when you're in a training console or something, right? You're not, you're not hand right. over hand. <laughs> so I, I think you have some experience in different ways, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm, um, well, and I, you know, I teach circus too. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes I'll be like, okay, I want your hand here. Right. Like I'm like, okay, just move your hand like that. Cool. Mm -hmm. Um, however, teaching online has changed a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> 10 classes a week for like going on three months is, um, yeah. I've learned a lot of new things. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that, that that's one thing where I, it's, I don't think it always necessarily looks particularly traumatic. I mean, I've seen videos where I, I would describe it that way um, uh, for the learner, um, but, but I don't, but I just think there's probably another way that's also a little more effective. Yeah. Um, and that involves a little less, um, you know, uh, intrusiveness, right? Um, and I don't necessarily know what those are in certain situations, but, you know, like we were talking about this earlier, right? Like if I wanted to teach a lion to target its foot to something, I'm not going to pick up its paw and, <laughs> yeah. uh, right? <laughs> um, it might not kill me, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, or an elephant or a rhino. And so one of my plans is to have a bumper sticker that says, would you do it with a lion? And if the answer is no, why would you do it with a puppy? Why would you yeah, do yeah. it? Why would you do it with something that you could overpower? Yeah. Um, and that you could physically manipulate. And so I think, I think whenever we get to that point, um, and I'm not saying that I've never done it, um, but I think if ever I start to feel like I need to get to that point, I have to take a step back. If I have to, I can write a functional assessment. I can do, you know, whatever yeah. I need to do. Um, but I think that's just, I think that's a really great um, source of information about how do we address this a little differently to be more effective, but also, yeah. um, more ethical and better for the learner yeah it's almost like um building a sort of like sense of awareness of when certain things happen you have to realize it's like learning when to step back and like mm -hmm. rethink things right like mm -hmm. that's that's like the critical skill that's super hard there um, totally. and then i guess another proactive thing that comes to mind is any opportunity you can have to start working in different settings with different species whatever it is is probably only going to help you, right? I mean, uh, with the assumption of you're working with someone that's ethical and doing things correctly. Um, but like the, I never in my life thought that I would be like training goldfish. And I remember when I was in grad school and they were like, hey, you wanna be the fish lab manager? And I was like, what's that entail? They're like, well, you, if you can train fish and you can do these things, demonstrate some competencies here and there, then you'll run this for a couple of years. And I was like, huh, uh, why? And quickly, <laughs> before we went on air, I was telling, uh, I was talking with Peter about how um, there's a number of factors there. Couldn't touch, similar to your lion example there. Um, but I also had uh, the, the interaction with water um, that I just was not ready for and used to and currents moving around. Um, I give the example sometimes, like if people were to uh, say drop a token for, they have a token procedure in, in, in that sort of BCBA world, and imagine that the, the air just kind of picks it up and floats it away. And what's your target that you're working on there is sitting appropriately in the chair. But when you deliver it, they stand up to grab it because it's floating away. What's actually going on there is you're reinforcing the, kind of the opposite of what your target was on that one. Um, and there was things like that that I actively ran into. Um, and then realized also, like I, like I said, I couldn't touch and prompt, but I also couldn't like say, swim over here or go over here. Like that just doesn't yeah. work. Um, don't so, remember what we were doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like having your hands tied in that sense um, was very uh, beneficial. It was frustrating and difficult and weird at first. 
Um, it's one of those things after five or 10 minutes, you're just like, why am I doing this? And you can walk out. Um, but it, I guess see, searching for opportunities like that. Like if I was ever living in the Seattle area, I think I'd be like, how do I hang out with Peter on Saturdays? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, to, to get a little bit of experience in these things. I mean, I'm down. Like, yeah. anyone <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's, I always try to figure out ways to kind of offer people practical tips. I think, um, especially now, if you have the time to kind of pick up and learn something or pay attention to something else, totally. if you're, if you have the opportunity and that luxury, um, that's a, that's a great way to go about it. What yeah. were you going to say before I went on that? Do you remember? I, I don't, but I really enjoyed what just happened. So. <laughs> okay. Same here. Um, um, I actually, speaking of working with other species, I have some other videos that I sent you. Okay. Let's um, answer one question real quick. Yeah, let's do it. And then let's move into those. Cause I totally forgot that we had a question. So Jacqueline said, how do birds typically respond to aversives? So dogs tend to be more appeasing uh, to reduce the conflict. Cats tend towards more aggression. Can you, uh, can you intimidate birds into obedience as easily as you can dogs, for example? Um, well, I think the first thing about that question is that I would... Um, like, remember that we, like, need to take it as, like, an individual, right? Like, yeah. like um, I've certainly met dogs that their first reaction would be aggression, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, which is scary. Um, so, it really depends on the learning history of that bird. Mm -hmm. um, so, obviously, always, right? Um, but, uh, so, and this is actually one thing I talk about a lot in consultations, um, is I'll be like, hey, did you see that weight shift in its leg? That meant stop. Okay. It's literally, it's literally this. Yeah. And it means stop. And, and, and the tendency is like to just kind of keep moving, mm -hmm. right? Um, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And so I can see all the little tiny things that change. And with parrots and, and birds in general, we're not just like, oh, it's a parrot. We're looking like, what locale is that parrot from? Yeah. <laughs> like, because that's going to change their behavior, right? On, mm -hmm. on, on a level, macaws act very differently than African greys. And it's kind of funny in the parrot world, we've got the cockatoo people, the gray people, the macaw people, right? And then like, we, we have all, these different cultures. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's totally, yeah. and they interact with things differently. Yeah. Um, when a gray puts its head down, ch chances are it's not asking for head scratches. You're probably mm -hmm. going to get bit um <laughs> so so there's there's that um sometimes what will happen um one of those things one of these old school ways to train parrots is to basically put a glove on put the bird in a box tub and just put your hand into it and let the bird chew on you for as long as it possibly can until it realizes that chewing doesn't work and so it never yeah. chews, right mm -hmm. so it's like it's it's letting contingency right um, yeah. uh and what happens when that starts to happen is all of a sudden they stop giving cues ahead of time. So if a bird has learned that no matter what I do before I bite doesn't work, mm -hmm. why do it? So then you've got a bird that blind signs you. Like they were fine one second, you thought they were fine, your hand was presenting, and the next thing you know, you're bleeding, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's because that bird's learning history has been nothing else works. Why would I spend any time or energy on that? Let me just use this other thing that I've got. Yeah. Um, so that can, so that's pretty common. I don't see that as more as I did, as I did a, like a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm still definitely seeing it. The other thing is um, if I'm in a consult and I start to see that, um, they still do give you a couple cues, but they're really small. And so I'll jump on those and be like, Hey, stop. Okay. Let's reevaluate and move forward. Yeah. Uh, yeah, totally consent. Um, for sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, it really depends on the learning history. Um, one thing that also, um, influences a lot is in the U S, um, it's pretty standard. It's changing from what I can see. Um, it's pretty standard to clip birds' wings. Mm -hmm. um, so the feathers do grow back, um, but they will clip usually um, the first five to 10 primary flight feathers. So they've got yeah. 10 and then they've got 10. And so primaries and then secondaries, and they usually clip, clip the primaries to prevent them from flying. Mm 
um, I did that once upon a time because that's what you did. Yeah. Um, and then I saw the lights and I don't flip <laughs> ever. Like yeah. you can pay me enough to do that to one of my birds. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, there's so many reasons for doing that. But one of the things people will say is, well, if he's flighted, he's meaner or something like that, or he's not the same bird, his personality changes. Well, what you're looking at is now a bird who has the option to say no. I can just leave when yeah. I want to, right? Yeah. Bird can leave, as opposed to the bird who can't leave, and so it's gonna do what you want because it has no other option. Yeah. Right? When I was working in a, a, for some center for children with autism, came into a classroom about 10 or 12, um students grade one to kindergarten kind of a mix based on ability and ages and the primary thing um to help teachers really the, the natural reinforcement contingency for teachers and in that culture there was um that you set up your tables kind of in the corners so that you can be the instructor um I'm seeing if I have something here. I have a super messy <laughs> desk out here. But imagine if the desk was set up back here. angled this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Imagine if uh, the desk was kind of set up here and the children are there and I would be positioned, you know, out here in the center a little bit to where, yes, they could step up and walk around the table and like walk near me. But the whole point of what they did set up there was just this situation in which uh, their their legs were clipped, if I could, you know, make that, that connection really? there um, to where really there wasn't any uh, option of saying no or getting away and, 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 and yeah. anything like that. And so one of the first things I worked on really hard for a couple of weeks was um, trying to change that culture. And it was just through demonstration of like, Hey, if we use some positive reinforcement, we're really careful on how we go about this sort of things. Um, then we can start to do that. And it was, it was one of those things that uh, I worked my ass off <laughs> for those first few weeks on doing that. But the respect that came, not from the students, uh, from the students, yes, super mm -hmm. important there. Um, and like the interactions that happened there, but also the respect that came from the staff in those areas, mm -hmm. kind of realizing like, oh, we could do this differently. And it's better for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> um, totally. It was really good. And it was, uh, always reminds me, um, the unfortunate part when I was consulting sometimes was it was like, I needed that time to really spend, to demonstrate these things sometimes. And it was really pressing, I guess. And and how to demonstrate it quickly. If I only had an hour, for example, um, it was super tricky. Yeah, but yeah it was, you reminded me of that. Um, totally. It wasn't, well, wasn't clipping was wings, probably, but we, so might as, we might as well have been gluing butts to chairs, as, you know, and, yeah. and things like that at the same time. Well, I'm, so, I'm assuming you maybe saw like less uh, escape avoidance behaviors, not that they could be achieved, but I'm assuming you saw some of that, maybe like, I, I don't know, maybe less aggression or something like that. Yeah. Um, you gave them the option to move away yeah no there's the, the whole the whole situation improved over um i mean once you once you ask because so like once you start getting those reinforcement histories built in there too like um there's i don't know like the, the byproduct of that reinforcement history is like trust in some of these situations too so like we could Brilliant. we could start to work <laughs> uh and, and kind of trust each other more and more as we went about these sort of things whether it was them getting more and more freedom in certain situations um, where they typically wouldn't, or us kind of them working with us, right? And kind of the goals that we had is of teaching certain targets and skills. Totally. So, yeah, no, and 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 it's and it's also a little kind of like one of the more nervous times I get during consults. Which why am I saying this to the internet? But um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is um like when we're first implementing that, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I'm first like, yeah, it's okay for your bird to go away. And then I'm like, is the bird coming back? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then I don't want my client to be like, wow, we accomplished nothing. And I'm like, no, we actually did. Like, um, I made a little <laughs> video recently about one of, uh, an environment I had with my client and her bird is super cool. His name, her name's Ozzy. And um, this bird, like, we've just learned so much about how she exercises choice. Mm -hmm. So we've got like our perch and this is all video consult, right? So I'm like sitting there trying to like, okay, hand up three inches, hand, but you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> stuff like that. But she's got her perch that we train on, right? Um, and if she goes off that perch, 
We don't ask her for anything. She yeah. can sit on her little tunnel, sit there, wait, take a moment if she needs to, preen, scratch her head, something like that. Comes back, trains a little bit more, takes mm -hmm. a break. And then um, one of, not the last, but the one before this or uh, two weeks ago, um, she literally in the middle of the training acted like she was totally normal and then all of a sudden just turned around and walked away. And this bird's never locked in a cage. And so it just like walks to the other side of the room basically on its like perches and stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Um, she hasn't ever gone that far before. We might be done, right? Yeah. And, um, so then I'm like, let's talk about the training session. So where I'm talking to the client, we're like, yeah, okay, here, let's go this. And the next thing you know, she like comes down, gets in front of, gets onto the training person, is ready, mm -hmm. right? And like, she just needed a break. And to me, that's like the coolest thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> My bird said no, and then said yes. Yeah. And that's one of the things I love about free flying, right? Is I don't even always give treats and stuff. Like he'll come down just to cuddle with me. And to, like yeah. play. He also he's only allowed to play with my hair when we're outside because he loves playing with my hair. Yeah. Um, and so I use my hair actually as a reinforcer for yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so he'll come down and we call it pretty lady because he like will literally stick his head underneath my hair and just like drape it around him and like preen it. Yeah. <laughs> I love him so much. But yeah, so it was it's 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 this really I love providing this option of choice and this this you know option of disengagement. Um one because it's telling me something and two because it's so cool when they choose to interact with you again yeah <laughs> it's like so yeah. exciting yeah yeah um and that's also uh, part of that exciting is like it's building in that natural reinforcement for you right in that moment like totally. you're 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 uh i'm assuming you're aware of it but like if everyone isn't like that's that excitement's probably part of what you value and what you want to do of this positive reinforcement training actually getting caught in a reinforcement loop under the right circumstances yeah. right like it's working <laughs> a good you, proper analysis has worked you've said natural reinforcement a couple of times can you operationalize that for me ah uh, yeah sorry so uh, no, it's okay. i'm just curious yeah uh i would say that typically it's talked about as the natural reinforcers versus contrived or programmed and so mm -hmm. things that were uh, intentionally put in as part of the training program as opposed to things that would happen if you were just naturally going about your day. The mm. thing is, is it's used pretty loosely. Uh, I use it a little bit loosely there too. Um, and so, yeah, program versus contrived. Uh, so program contrived versus um, program contrived natural, I think is okay. loosely what it is. But you'll hear a lot of analysts talk about natural reinforcement when it's more so that they're trying to program contrive reinforcement and then ultimately build it into this natural reinforcement contingency when okay. the whole time it was a programmed or contrived thing. Right. right. Okay. Okay, cool. Awesome. So, Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Um, sweet. I don't even know where I picked that up. <laughs> you and you <laughs> asked that, I was like trying to go back. I was like, hmm. Um, <laughs> so was there any other uh, videos you wanted to show? Yeah. Did we, was that the one question we had or did we have more? That was the one question. Okay. Um, I asked for like a last call. Kind of, I, I didn't say last call, but I was just like, if anyone wants any okay. other questions, let me know. Yeah. So the second to last video is me training one of my goats. <laughs> All right. Let's do that one. Oh, and I got one. I'm teaching someone using basically tag to see someone on trapeze. All right. So let's do the... Uh... Yeah, goat. Let's do the goat oh. first. Make sure I've got my Fun. headphones all set up real quick. Boom, boom, boom. And so right now we're working on um, holding on and proofing, right? So stay on the rock and I'm going to move around and do stuff. Um, and this is where doing a little circus comes in handy because I can do some weird stuff. Um, <laughs> and uh, just give her like a lot of bizarre stuff that honestly because she's my goat she'll probably end up ex experiencing you know, and seeing <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> always got chickens nearby making sure i don't drop anything yep <laughs> <laughs> always look kind of stupid but I, I really love proofing like this and that one's hard because oftentimes when i'm squatting i'm going to reinforce Yeah, so that's one that's a little more tempting, maybe, to come off the rock for. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, was this early on, or did you work hard up until this point? Because I see so, that they're pretty, they're pretty quick, right? 
three, oh, goats four to five so seconds. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, the goat's fast, but also your your delivery is very quick too here, roughly four or five, yeah. six seconds, right? I'm also definitely a food chucker, um, for sure. I'm like always throwing food at them and reinforcing okay. them. But yeah, um, they learn really, really quick um, to the point where like I actually now have to work on a get off cue because they'll stay there forever. <laughs> like I could lay on the floor and roll around and do whatever, feed another goat. And they're like, mom. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I thought it would be cool. Do you want to watch the tortoise one or do you want to see the trapeze one? I want to see both actually, if you got the time. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, okay. So the tortoise one is just above that one. Cool, let's start with the tortoise one since it's here. Um, boom, boom, boom. There's two, either one work. Cool. Here we this go. is Storm, and we're, I use this little Kong on a chopstick to teach her to target, to follow it. <laughs> we'll definitely have to end on it, you sharing with everyone all the different animals. Will do. And so she can be pretty shy. Um, and so it, um, and then she also had like pneumonia and some other stuff that I had to deal with that meant like I had to medicate her all the time. And all yeah. That. So that was really stressful. Um, How do you identify pneumonia in a tortoise? Uh, she literally, when she was breathing, she was whistling. Really? And we took her in for an x-ray and they're like, yeah. Yeah. Do it in her lungs. It's crazy. And then we have our target up. And one thing with reptiles I've learned so much is about deliberate, uh, like reinforcement delivery, right? Um, mm. It's like, how do, I, how do I present this without them recoiling back? In the case of snakes, um, mm -hmm. how do I present them without them coming forward really fast? Yeah. Um, uh, that kind <laughs> of thing. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. How long ago was this? Probably half a year ago, it looks like, yeah. Yeah. She's yeah, she um she's actually right there. You chowing down storm. How many uh how often do you work? Um how, are you training constantly? All day, every day. <laughs> With the, I'm training more now that I'm at home all the time, which is great. Yeah. Um, I'll have like a cancellation and then I'm like, oh, I'll go fly the boys or let me go train or something. One thing yeah. I've been trying to practice is taking more data. Um, I think you know this, but Eddie or Eduardo Fernandez and I are yeah. really good friends. Um, and so we have this like meeting group that comes out either. Well, it's online right now, but we would come out to the house. We read some research papers and then we go out and train all my animals. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh one of the things that he's really into um and then i'm trying really hard to get into it's just kind of hard to motivate myself sometimes is like literally taking data like while i'm training yeah. um, and i'm a very on the fly trainer i just like go move and and generally i'm pretty well reinforced for that because i get a lot of behavior yeah. um and so sometimes like i also hate counting ask any of my students so when i'm like canning counting okay how many seconds okay and then that was a successful trial that wasn't a successful trial winning for you. Like all of that, it's like so, so hard, but I'm yeah. getting it, figuring it out. <laughs> uh, but so I've been doing that more now too. Um, yeah. And you know, that, so that's been cool. Um, I can only, I always have like what I call snake training day. So um, I have five snakes and two of them eat weekly and the other two eat about um, twice a month. Um, and so, I can't train them every day, right? I could, yeah. but they get fat and that would not be okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and then if, you know, it'll be like, it's really frustrating too, because like, I love training the snakes so much. Um, and so I'm like, oh, I just need more snakes. Uh, <laughs> um, which I don't need more snakes. Um, but I'll, I'll, I will, then they'll go into a shed cycle and you don't feed them while they're in the shed cycle. And then I just have to sit there and like wait for them and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, so I definitely don't train them every single day. Um, I try and do something with all, with the birds every single day. Um, we have 17 in our house, um, and six of them are mine. And so it's hard for me to keep up with all of them. Um, quite frankly, um, that yeah. being said, they, they're always doing stuff and I'm always interacting with them. It's just whether it's like actual training session. Yeah. Um, I'm actually hoping to write an article about like how the training session is never over and every interaction is an opportunity for, um, 
like trust building and all that kind of thing. So yeah, hopefully I always talk about all these articles I'm going to write and I never do. But <laughs> I, I want to write that one. <laughs> get, get to it. Get to, put it on the list. Get to it when you have time. Yeah, exactly. Um, we had a quick question from Jacqueline. I hear all the time from bird owners that their birds only like them and not the husband, etc. Is this a real thing? It's a real thing that can be prevented <laughs> and mitigated. Um, so, or corrected. Um, so typically I find what happens is in that situation, the preferred person, um, and these birds get called one person birds or only person birds. Um, okay. and they paint that brush with like an entire species. Like, oh, don't get this species. They're only gonna want like one person. Um, typically what happens in those situations, um, once I go in for a consult, um, I'm seeing a lot of unintentional, um, reinforcement of reproductive behavior. Okay. Um, and so then you get, um, a bird who develops for lack of a better term, a pair bond with one person. Okay. Um, and a lot, most species of parrot, um, are flock birds, but during the breeding season, they become pairs and they have territories um there's uh this port the puerto rican amazon study it was really amazing they had um uh, a, a young male flew into the territory of like a pair mm -hmm. and the adult male went after him and they literally were fighting so hard they tumbled down to the forest floor and the researchers were able to come pick up these two wild birds and pull them apart because that's how crazy insane they were about yeah. training kill each other right yeah um so that can happen they have very strong all that kind of thing um and that's one thing to remember too is that these are wild animals like milo's yeah. <laughs> have been put in the in the nest of a wild military macaw and he would have grown up like any other military macaw as far as i know right yeah um so it's not like handing a chihuahua to a wolf and being like ah, i'll be fine like you know what i mean like yeah, they're yeah. Very, <laughs> very different um <laughs> Um, I don't see that going over well yeah, <laughs> in a number right. of ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that that does happen. There are ways to mitigate and to change that. Um, and that's definitely something I end up working on with people. Um, it usually does end up change, having to change like a lot about the way they interact with their bird. Um, and the other thing that happens with that sometimes is um, one person is the bird person. Yeah. And the other person is like, yeah, you can get a bird, whatever, kind of thing like that or they weren't even happy about the bird. So then one of two things happen. The bird bonds with the, or becomes, has a really strong reinforcement history with the one that doesn't like him or the other one, and then they pick, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so, so yes, it's a thing. Um, it's not like a disease though. It's not like something they just have and that's how yeah. they are, <laughs> um, right? It's all based <laughs> on um, learning history. Interaction, learning history. Yeah, interactions, yeah, yeah. cool. Um, so the trapeze work. Yeah, it should be at the top, the first uh, one I sent you. I've got it. So maybe tell us what's going on here, but then also maybe build the bridge, um, as to like, maybe yeah. why you like work in this area. So this is my bestie, Andrew, and I was teaching him swings. Um, and in a swing, um, in the back, um, you have to close your shoulders. So in order to pull your um, chest up mm -hmm. to get better for a swing, you actually have to pull your shoulder blades down. Yes. And so when he does that in the back, I click. Do you see how his shoulders went down, his armpits closed a little bit in that mm -hmm. one? There. Yeah. And so we were doing this and I, I brought the clicker out because he was having a hard time. Um, and he can tell you it helps. It helps him yeah. a lot. I mean, it's a perfect, yeah. perfect application of tag teach. Yeah. And uh, when you need that quick signal, it's also something that you can see relatively easily as the trainer, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, and actually there's also a video of me um, tagging myself. I don't know if you want to see that one. Tagging what? Uh, a video of me tagging myself. Do you want to see that one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever seen someone tagging themselves. 
Yeah, self-tagging. You haven't heard of self-tagging? I feel like if uh, Joan's still watching or watches this afterwards and catches me on this, I so don't think so, but I think I'm going to be in trouble. I think so. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you want to DM it again on Instagram, I can yeah. maybe find it. Uh, da, 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 da. So basically what I'm trying to do in this video that I'm about to find and then send you is... While you're looking, if uh, since this kind of operates on its own afterwards, the video, um, the tagging that we're talking about is tag teach. If anyone hasn't dug into it, um, tag teach international. Get that tag, yo. <laughs> um, really cool community. I actually know that uh, Joan and them been working hard on a member forum that they just launched too. So. Big shout out, and if you all don't know about that already, um, and you're part of that community, you probably got some emails hanging around. Um, but I'll make sure to share the link real quick in the live here. Aha, here it is. Maybe, did I lose my live? Here we go. All right, sweet, um, got it. So I look really furious in this photo because it's really fucking hard. <laughs> so basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to square my hip. So you see how my heel is over my head. I want my heel in line with that same side shoulder. Okay, um, so where it's at is your goal? Your no, target? I want it no. all the way Oh, the same side. Over. Okay. Time point is heel out. Nice, just working in the mirror, huh? Yep. <laughs> it's so hard. <laughs> yeah. Are you looking in a mirror while you're doing this? Yeah. So you also have that feedback loop of it's kind of opposite that you're not used to, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then I, that's my dominant side, so I'm a little better at that side. Yeah. And why were you practicing again? Did I miss this? Uh, no, so um, I think I pulled out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when you're in, um, so you can do, let's see, should I try to think how to, here, okay, I'll just demo real quick. Okay. <clears throat> so, if I'm here, mm -hmm. I want to be there, not there. Mm -hmm. So if I'm here, my hip tends to move in this direction, and it's not the most advantageous way for my, like, my bone to move. Okay. So I want it to be here, so then it goes towards my head till it's that same ear yeah. as the other place. Okay. Um, and uh, that's because, uh, like, you don't – if you're going to be grabbing your foot behind your head and straightening it, you mm -hmm. don't want your hip turning and turning your torso. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's why I'm doing that one. Um, it's also, uh, I mean, Teresa did it. It's really good for handstands too. Tag teach yeah. it. Nice. Um, I have, it's, I actually have a bunch of students who want me to tag teach them. Um, but right now I think the delay is going to be too much online. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I yeah, can't that. wait to like, see people and bring my clicker. Yeah. And the actually really cool thing about um, that video is that's at one of my circus schools that I, that I teach at. And um, the owner um, is, has taken a bunch of KPA classes and does um, clicker training and positive reinforcement with um, her dog. Mm -hmm. um, and so literally that wasn't even my clicker. It was just there because <laughs> it was the yeah. dog's clicker. And so I grabbed it. <laughs> but Very cool. Yeah. Um, maybe as a fun wrap up activity, all of the animals that you play. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> don't ask me the total number. I can go by species. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I have one tortoise, one bearded dragon, one gecko who was actually found in a pottery shipment from Korea. Really? Um, he's more <laughs> traveled than I am. Um, <laughs> 
we've got five snakes. Um, my other roommates have fish tanks. Um, and then we have 17 parrots in our house right now. Um, six of them are mine. Um, we have two Great Pyrenees crosses um, and a Jack Russell Terrier. We have nine goats. I always lose count of the chickens. I think it's 22 right now. Okay. Um, we've got five ducks, a pheasant, six pigeons, seven pigeons. Um, is that it? I think that's it. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah. I think, I think, I think your total is 71. I tried keeping up there. On the really? Map. Yeah. If I, if I kept up. Um, <laughs> it's great. So, um, yeah, the, I guess it's, uh, it seems like it would require a ton of time and training and things like that. Is that just kind of, yes, it is or yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and like, I think obviously I can't train all those animals as much as I want. Like I would love, like, I would love for all 23 of the chickens to like have voluntary blood draws and yeah. like, <laughs> my goats do stand for injections. Um, and, uh, we're working on hoof care training for them too. Okay. But yeah, no, it's, it's a lot. Um, and then I also teach circus. Um, and yeah. not only do I teach, I have to train my train on my own too. So yeah. it's certainly a lot. Um, I also would not change anything at all. Oh, two spiders. Okay. Two spiders. 73. Okay. 73 yeah. I've got two, I've got two spiders, two tarantulas. <laughs> um, I'm actually in the process of trying to train one of them right now. We'll see how it goes. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, I'm really grateful to live with two other animal people. <laughs> um, and we each have our own animals. Um, one of them only has three birds and the other one has, um, like we share the goats. Um, and four of the goats were actually born here last year. Okay. Um, and they just turned a year old. Um, and they're amazing. Oh my God, I love them so much. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work it's the best. Um, I also kind of view it as like part of my job too. Um, in that like in order to become a good trainer, I need to train. Um, yeah. and so I, so I train all the time. Yeah. Um, I don't train every single bird every single day. Um, quite frankly, Milo probably gets trained the most, um, just cause I try and fly, fly him whenever I have time and there's a nice mm -hmm. day, which has been quite a lot lately. Yeah. Um, uh, in terms of the time, at least. Um, and so I'm training him a lot. Um, I've been doing some um, training stuff with him for uh, Susan Friedman to use in her presentations. Um, I've been doing some goat stuff for um, Lori Stevens to use in her presentations, um, which is always kind of cool. It's, kind of, it's fun to get like a little challenge. Yeah, um, yeah, nice. And yeah, so that's, those are, those are my kiddos. Cool. Uh, yeah, and if y'all are ever in Seattle, hit me up. And yeah. Welcome to come um, out. Animals. Yeah, no, I appreciate the time today. Um, where do people find you? Taking Wing Consulting? Thank you. Yes. Um, so, uh, Taking Wing Consulting um, is my Instagram and my Facebook. Um, and um, my other Instagram is Trap Torsion um, if you want to see circus stuff. Trap Torsion, um, huh? E R A P T O R T I O N. Con it's trapeze and contortion turned into one. Found it. Not gonna lie, pretty proud of it. Um, so that, um, and then the other thing is, um, my bestie, um, Carrie Kish and I, um, work together, um, on a company, with a company called Reptelligence. Um, that group was actually linked, the Facebook one. Someone was asking and someone else shared it. So oh, that's great. Yeah. That's the reptile group. enrichment training. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. And then we have a Facebook group that's super cool. Um, and then we also have um, an Instagram as well um, that I, I'm, I'm the director of training and media. So that's mostly me. The, the um, Instagram is, um, and that is, we forgot the password for the actual reptelligence one. So it's reptile intelligence is the. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. Yeah. Cool. I shared these in there. Um, any closing thoughts? 
Um, get out there and train. Change your species. They're cool. Yeah, nice. I love that. It's perfect. Yeah. Um, cool.